I am really excited, and and I I told our our speaker that I'm I'm very worried about saying his name correctly, so I'm going to try my personal best, and then he can say it correctly. But he said I got a good, pretty good. Um, it's Dr. Vicente Planellas. Okay, um, he is a professor in the Department of Pathology in the Division of Microbiology and Immunology here at the U of U, and is also in HCI. Um, his research is to understand the events, um, to understand cell death and abnormal cell death and normal cell death, I think. Um, this is way outside my expertise, so I'm going to take notes because that is why we love what is, um, so that we can learn. I'm a psychologist by training, so remember that when you're talking. Um, <laughs> and we are, um, um, he did his undergraduate training in Spain and got his PhD from UC Davis. And we're super excited to have you and we'll let you take it away so we can learn um, more from you today. Excellent. Um, thank you, Angie. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, I was kind of hoping you could come up with a more like time relevant topic than what is vaccine. <laughs> uh, say that again for me, I'm sorry. I said, like, we're wishing you were to come up with something a little bit more appropriate for the times. I mean, this is so esoteric, like how is this going to benefit us? And, yeah, you uh, know, I, I, I really, really uh, want to talk about vaccines. Um, so thank you for allowing me this, even though um, I haven't, my lab hasn't worked on vaccines for a very, very long time, but uh, my PhD was on vaccines. And I am proud to share with you that my PhD uh, resulted in the um, production of the first failed HIV vaccine. And that was only a sign of things to come. And uh, since then, I've worked on other aspects of uh, viral pathogenesis, but I've uh, I've watched the vaccine field uh, very closely. And um, so today we're gonna talk about, you know, the nuts and bolts of what a vaccine is like. And, um, and you can see my screen, I hope. So um, I will start with a very simple, um, uh, let's see if I can, okay. Um, what are vaccines? Um, no, um, let's see, hide names and annotations, hide floating meeting control, ah, there you go. Okay, so I hope that I will convince you today that vaccines are the most intelligent tool that uh, Western medicine has not only because of their effectiveness, but also because they're the, it's, it's the cheapest and it's the safest um, tool that we have in our toolbox. And just think about it. Um, a vaccine only needs to be administered one, two, or three times, depending on how many boosts it needs. Um, think about a drug that you use for hypertension or uh, cholesterol. You need to use that drug on a daily basis for the rest of your life, um, oftentimes. Um, whereas a vaccine, you know, can work um, as a one-shot deal. So uh, something that I think is very important. Um, a little bit of history. So in China and India, in, in the Middle Age, they were doing this thing called variolation. And they, they realized that if somebody had smallpox and therefore people had these postules, uh, let me make my pointer options, laser green, let's see. Um, oh, that didn't work. Um, laser pointer. Well, you've already taught me one thing. I didn't know that feature even existed. So thank you. <laughs> which, which picture? The laser pointer. That is so oh, cool. Yes. Okay. So, um, so this individual has uh, smallpox. Um, a lot of you have not seen smallpox because smallpox has been eradicated. This is a disease that doesn't exist anymore. And it's only uh, thanks to um, the existence of an effective vaccine 
that was uh, promoted um, in all the right places all over the world. And so um, now the Chinese and the Indians realized that if you took pus and crystals from a wound and you inoculated them on the skin of a person that wasn't infected, that would often protect them from developing smallpox. And, um, and we're gonna talk a lot about smallpox because smallpox is really um, the poster child for, for vaccines and what vaccines can help us achieve. This is Ed Jenner, who in uh, England in the 18th century um, developed the first um, bona fide vaccine in our in our history, and I'm going to talk about it, about how this came about. So, so he and others observed that when, uh, and again, this is also about smallpox. Um, he and others observed that when milkmaids. Um, milk the, the cows, they often came down with pustules that were similar in appearance to smallpox. However, uh, you know, smallpox is 80% lethal disease. It can kill up to 80% of infected individuals. Cowpox was very mild. It never killed anyone and produced a, a low-grade fever um, at worst. And then people would get better and um, would go, go on about their business. But what was being observed as well is that milkmaids never came down with smallpox. Whereas, you know, anybody else in the normal population, so these are the red postules here. So this is smallpox. So these are bad. And this person is going to get really sick really soon. So what happens with the milkmaid? So um, Jenner thought that perhaps um, if you got inoculated with uh, cowpox, may maybe you became immune to smallpox. And so he decided to test that. And the way he did it is he, he took uh, James Phipps, which was the eight-year-old uh, son of his gardener. And um, <laughs> you think about doing this today and getting IRB approval for this. So he inoculated uh, James with the postules from Sarah who had cowpox. And then, you know, uh, James fell ill with this very mild disease. And um, so then they collected uh, scabs from a person who actually had developed smallpox. And they inoculated James with, with those to see if he would be immune. And they had to do this um, a number of times because the kid became completely immune to smallpox. So they inoculated James Phipps eight different times with with live smallpox and he never got sick, okay? So that's really the first vaccine that was developed. And of course, today we have uh, even better methods, but um, so here is a, uh, a chart showing you uh, most of the vaccines that have been developed. Um, COVID is not here, and I, I will I will mention COVID a few times as a as an example um, later. But um, you can see that in blue we have many successful vaccines. Okay, uh, in yellow we have vaccines that are partially effective, and two of those are tuberculosis. Um, this is a, a vaccine that is actually not used anymore in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and influenza, which um, obviously it is used and it should be used on a, on a daily basis because we got novel strains uh, that come every season. But you can see also in red that there's viruses for which, viruses um, and bacteria for which uh, vaccines are not yet developed. And so the, the, the very critical um, examples of that here are malaria, a disease that kills millions um, in um, tropical regions in the world, and um, HIV. We have not 
developed a vaccine for HIV that is um, that has any effectiveness. And as I said before, I am proud to share with you guys that uh, my PhD consisted in developing the first um, HIV vaccine, which was shown to be a complete failure in monkeys. And um, and and then we learned later on that um, the way that um, we can explain the failure of vaccines against HIV. HIV is a special virus in the sense that it resides, it infects the very central cells of the immune system, and then it dismantles the ability of uh, your immune system to mount an effective immune response. So um, there are pathogens that are um, incredibly adept at avoiding immune responses and HIV is obviously one of them. Hepatitis C is the same. And Ebola, which is also shown here, actually vaccines for Ebola are now emerging and we're hoping that we will have um, effective ones very soon. So now I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the concept of herd immunity, which, which is very important. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and we talk about this in the context of uh, COVID. Um, and uh, so here's a population where we have individuals in blue who are not immunized, and then individuals in red who are sick. And of course, they are going to spread the disease. And so, you know, a few months later, this entire population is practically, all of them are infected. Of course, there's no <clears throat> herd immunity here. Now, if you vaccinate, say 20% of the population, and so these are the people in yellow, and then you look at what happens with the virus here, uh, you will see that, um, the initial few infected individuals will spread throughout the population, will spread the disease. Um, and only those individuals who were vaccinated will really be protected, okay? So, so yes, this is a good reason to convince somebody to get immunized, right? Because they're gonna be safe. However, um, nobody else in the population is safe, but look what happens if upwards of 60 or 70% of the population is vaccinated, here we have the yellow people. So these, these people are, are vaccinated. I want you to focus on this individual here, okay? They are someone who is sick and uh, they're right now, they're at a grocery store. This person is at a grocery store and it comes in contact with this person here who's a nurse um, at a um, elderly care facility, um, this person could get infected from, um, from the infected individual. However, they're vaccinated. So when this person goes to the elderly care facility and there is your grandpa here and he is not vaccinated, um, but he's protected because everyone else around him is, um, is, is vaccinated. So even though he's not vaccinated, he's actually very protected. This, is, this could be a baby. In the case of measles, um, this could be an elder, elderly person. This could be somebody who is being treated for cancer and therefore their immune system is down. Um, if we look here, this person here would get infected because at the grocery store, this person would give the virus to the nurse. The nurse would go then take care of the elderly person and they would get sick, right? So um, herd immunity really works and is something that we are not doing well with COVID because so many people are unvaccinated that um, the virus is still amongst us and it's still um, growing and spreading. The other thing about COVID um, is that it has an unusual um, uh, way of uh, inducing immunity in the sense that within six months, immunity goes away. And therefore, somebody who was protected now is not protected anymore. So we need to throw in that uh, variable as well. We need to get um, vaccinated multiple times. 
So what are the characteristics of a vaccine, of an ideal vaccine? Well, of course, it has to be protect, protective. You know, we know that some are more protective than others. Flu is only about 60% protective. And in fact, it can be even worse some years. Um, it has to be safe. Of course, the vaccine itself cannot induce uh, symptoms or uh, illness that would be worse than the actual illness induced by, by the pathogen. Um, it, the, the protection has to be sustained, okay? Um, most vaccines generate lifelong immunity. This is the case for measles, um, it's the case for, or was the case for smallpox. Um, it is not the case for COVID-19. So here we need to uh, think about understanding uh, why the virus can avoid the immune response uh, so quickly within about six months of vaccination. Uh, this is a very important consideration when we design future vaccines against uh, coronaviruses. We need to uh, induce a longer uh, lasting immunity. Um, and then other considerations, you know, they can be cheap to produce. Um, they need to be stable. This is a problem with some particular vaccines. For example, the vaccine for COVID-19 for SARS is, is an RNA which is inherently of uh, low stability. So it has to maintain frozen at lower temperatures. This is a problem when, when, when going to uh, 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 third world countries where uh, deep freezers may not be available. Um, so uh, this is something else that we could work on is developing a COVID vaccine that will be uh, more biochemically stable. So I'm sure that will come in the future. And it should be easy to administer, right? So nobody likes intravenous shots. Um, and that's one of the reasons that many people don't want to get vaccines is because they don't like to get the shot. But for flu, we have um, flu mist, right? So this is a spray that is applied to your um, nasal mucosa. Um, and uh, for COVID, you know, um, this could be developed, even though um, our vaccines right now are intramuscular, I have to say the COVID vaccine is intramuscular because um, delivery of RNA has been uh, proven to be very effective when it's done intramuscularly. Um, and so if the RNA was provided um, intranasally, it would not have the type of um, effects that we desire. So, um, so there's a reason also for, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about routes of vaccination and how, how can they um, change things. Um, now, there are many types of vaccines. You cannot judge vaccines as a, a, as a monolith because every vaccine is different and there's reasons why vaccines have been developed in, in different ways. Um, live attenuated organisms, for example, the polio vaccine developed by um, Albert Sabin, um, which was grown in African green uh, monkey kidney cells, um, is a live attenuated vaccine. I'll, I'll give you an example and I'll, sh I'll show you how this works. Um, Second to that is killed organisms. So we can use chemicals to inactivate um, organisms. This is very popular with, works very well with bacteria. Um, we can have subunit vaccines. So this list that I'm preparing here, it goes from top to bottom. We're talking about, uh, you know, the more we're going from, from the, um, the least safe to the more safe, okay? So when we, get to subunit vaccines. The reason that subunit vaccines are so safe is because basically you've taken your pathogen and you've decided that you're gonna use just a part of it. So you don't have the entire pathogen there. You have a specific gene or a specific protein from the pathogen and you're using that as, a, as the vaccine and there's not a chance that the pathogen will um, reemerge uh, because uh, the genetic material from the pathogen is gone. So subunit vaccines are incredibly cheap, and, um, incredibly safe. An example of this is the hepatitis B vaccine, okay? The, uh, they have this, the, uh, the surface antigen, 
but the rest of the virus is um, not present. And there's a variety of that called the vectored vaccines where we use a virus that is not a pathogenic virus, such as vaccinia. Vaccinia is actually cowpox, or we can use canary pox or ad adenoviruses in a variety of others. So these are viruses that are known to cause no disease. We can incorporate uh, genes from um, say HIV or um, polio into one of these uh, viruses and use them as a vector to deliver the vaccine. Um, in more recent years, we have developed DNA vaccines. They're incredibly safe because the DNA uh, is in a plasmid and it, it encodes the antigens that you're interested in. And <clears throat> it's very, very safe. And the newest kind of vaccine that we have is the RNA vaccines, and we only have one, right? Which is, or two, actually COVID vaccines, um, both Pfizer and Moderna make RNA vaccines. And they've shown to be uh, very effective. Although, um, you know, some people have complained about side effects from the vaccine at the, at the site of inoculation. And um, if you had previous immunity to coronavirus, you may have a reaction, but it's really not a reaction that we should be concerned about. Um, and I just wanted to introduce here, you know, why do we use DNA or RNA or protein? Well, <clears throat> our immune system recognizes proteins. Um, and so we need to present the body with proteins so that we can mount an immune response. However, we can also use DNA, which um, if it's uh, prepared in the right um, context, the DNA will be transcribed into RNA and the RNA will be translated into protein and then there's your vaccine. So you, you can use any of these uh, systems uh, because of the, how the flow of information occurs in, um, in biology. Well, the reason I have before 1970 here is, um, is because in 1970, it was discovered that uh, some viruses have reverse transcription, so they can actually convert RNA back into DNA, okay? So the central dogma of biology is no more. Um, okay, so um, an example of an attenuated organism. So um, what you do is you, uh, you culture your pathogen in human cells, you know, let's say that this is the polio virus. It grows very well in human cells. We harvest the virus, and then we put it in a separate um, tissue culture flask, and we have this virus now infect a different species. So in this case, in the case of the saving vaccine, it was um, kidney cells from a um, African green monkey. So the virus grew there, of course, the virus um, is not adapted to grow optimally in uh, monkey cells, but after many passages, the virus will mutate to, to adapt and grow more optimally, right? Now, what happens with this virus if we put it back in the cells, in the cells of origin in human cells? Now the virus grows very, very poorly because um, it has adapted to growing in mon monkey cells. So now it grows very poorly in human cells and it's been attenuated. So this is, here's your vaccine, okay? So, so this virus can be given as a vaccine and it will produce a minor infection, uh, typically without any symptoms, but it will be very highly immunogenic for a number of reasons. Um, First of all, it presents all of the proteins and all of the antigens that the virus normally has, and it uh, establishes a um, life cycle that is complete. And so um, all the phases of the life cycle of this virus are being um, exposed to the immune system. And so the vaccines like this are uh, very potent. Um, now, there's problems with attenuated organisms because the mutations that um, allowed the virus to replicate in rhesus cells, in monkey cells, but not in human cells, can revert. 
And so with a very low frequency, these mutations can actually revert and you can get back wild type virus, okay, which can cause full-blown disease. So one has to be careful when using attenuated organisms to make sure that um, the, the number of mutations that have been introduced is, is big enough that reversion is impossible. And in fact, with the polio vaccine, um, it, was, it was understood um, after the fact that it only took three uh, point mutations to um, the difference between the virus that could grow in human cells and the virus that could grow in monkey cells was three mutations and with a low but um, exit with a free with certain frequency um, the virus could revert and some people actually got sick and got polio from the vaccine which is incredibly unfortunate with a frequency and I want to say you know one in a hundred thousand or less um, so you know for people who have their uh, their doubts about vaccines you know yes problems with vaccines ha have occurred in the past and we we've learned from it and so th these are things that uh, the scientific community has learned and has been able to correct so vac vaccines today are incredibly safe um, and we continue to make them safer um, Okay, so if you use recombinant DNA technologies, you can do some very, very elegant and very safe um, uh, vaccine design because you can take your pathogen and let's say that you know the functions of the different genes. So this green part here is the receptor binding protein. Here we have the, the uh, core or capsid proteins. And here we have genes that we know are necessary for the virus to be virulent. And in fact, we know this for a lot of organisms. We can actually take the virulence genes and we can completely eliminate them if they're not uh, necessary for virus replication. Um, and, and that tends to be the case in many cases because the, the genes that, are, that um, confer virulence to, to viruses tend to be genes that uh, help avoid the immune response, um, but they're not critical for the virus to be able to replicate. Or we can, we can delete the virulent genes or we can mutate them uh, with uh, multiple mutations to ensure that they will not revert. Um, for um, whole killed organisms, um, here we have an example of a bacterium, uh, Bordetella pertussis, causes um, a whooping cough. And there's two ways that you can generate a very effective vaccine. Is one is you can take a uh, whole bacteria and you can um, inactivate it with certain chemicals that are uh, fixative agents. And so uh, these chemicals will covalently uh, link all of the proteins in this organism and will um, preserve a lot of structures enough that this organism, when injected as a vaccine, will be uh, the immune system is going to think uh, that this is the real uh, bacterium is going to mount a very vigorous immune response. If we want it to be even um, uh, safer, we could make an acellular vaccine. So we can take the, uh, we can further lyse and inactivate the bacteria and, and get a mixture of bacterial components, which themselves can be highly immunogenic. And so we can use this as a vaccine as well. And this would be safer, right? Because um, in theory, uh, the inactivation of um, pathogens using chemical agents um, can fail. And in fact, there was one case that I want to share with you when uh, another vaccine for polio um, uh, that was um, uh, chemically inactivated, um, there was a particular batch where the chemical inactivation was incomplete. And so there was uh, the remainder, the, the, there was the presence of, of live virus 
um, in, in that vaccine and individuals who were vaccinated got polio from the vaccine, okay? So, so this was based on the Jonas Salk vaccine. And of course, this was another instance where a vaccine uh, backfired um, in a small number of individuals. And well, you know, we've learned from that. This happened uh, decades ago and we've learned and we've learned that vaccines need to have um, extensive quality control and controls. And, you know, that's what normally we do these days. Um, this is a long list of uh, different pathogens and vaccines that you can consult. So you can see what types of vaccines are more common. You can see there's a lot of um, attenuated virus. Um, and then there's um, a lot of them that are toxoids. So this is, for example, the, the tetanus and the diphtheria toxins can be chemi chemically modified so that they're inactive, uh, but they're still immunogenic. And in that case, they're called toxoids. Um, anyway, so, <clears throat> all right, very interesting how uh, the immune response works because um, when you first get um, infected or inoculated with um, a vaccine, you um, or with a pathogen, you develop an immune response. The immune response here appears uh, at seven to eight days post-infection, but in fact, um, more realistically, the the full uh, extent of a vaccine shows up at about two months post-vaccination, and so. Um, if you get infected with a pathogen, okay, let's say that this is the flu virus, um, and you have no immunity to the flu virus, well, the flu virus will generate its own immune response. Here we have the immune response. It'll take several weeks. However, the next time that you get exposed to the virus, and this would be the same for the booster shot of a vaccine, because your immune system has memory, now the time that it's going to take for this vaccine to uh, elicit um, appropriate antibodies instead of two months is gonna be more like a week, okay? So you have a much faster and uh, more vigorous immune response. It's called a memory response and is highly protected. And this is how vaccines work. We need to induce this memory response. And typically what does that is the, the secondary challenge, which is the boost, okay? Now the route of vaccination is very important um, and it can be um, in a variety of ways that you can see here. Um, and it, they have to do not only with where the pathogen is gonna be. So, for, for the flu virus, yes, intranasal immunization is very appropriate because that's where the virus enters the body. So if you have an immune response, meaning antibodies right there, you're gonna prevent disease much more effectively than if your antibodies are in the blood. Um, now, why do, do we not do this for um, SARS-CoV-2? Well, the reason is that um, the RNA is not delivered effectively in this way. The RNA is delivered um, more effectively intramuscularly. Now, I would anticipate that with time, um, people will develop uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that will be administered intranasally, and that would be very, very appropriate. For example, a live attenuated um, virus would be very appropriate here because it would induce the immune response uh, where it matters. The reason that we do it intramuscularly, as I said, is because RNA is delivered very effectively that way. It's the same with DNA as well. A DNA vaccine is administered um, in typically intramuscularly. Um, now you can make antibodies that are present in your, uh, in your plasma. And um, a, a lot of those antibodies can actually go across mucosal surfaces and end up um, in your nasal mucosa protecting you there. So, um, so that's why the COVID vaccine is still protective, even though it's a systemic vaccine that 
creates antibodies in the blood. Can I stop you for a second and ask a question? Because, oh, absolutely. Thank you. This, I have to tell you, you're explaining this very simplistically. So I thank you because a psychologist has understood every word that you've said, which is not usually what happens in these. Um, so, you know, a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, there was a big study that showed that the, the nasal mist weren't working, right? In the flu vaccines, it was much less effective than vaccines in the arms. So is, is that, was that just, it's, it wasn't as good of a vaccine? Is it that it's not as good going via the, you know, the nasal passages versus the, you know, I guess it would be intramuscular, I, I, you know? And cause I just got asked, the reason I'm actually kind of curious, A, I was like so bummed when that finding came out, but then I got asked yesterday as I was getting my kids vaccinated for one, for all for flu and one for COVID, um, yay. Um, is if we wanted the, the nasal and I'm like, oh no, not until I can see some evidence that's as effective as the, the shot. So I was just kind of curious why there was such a big difference a couple of years ago and ha have they been able to figure out what that problem was to make it more effective? So I missed, uh, the beginning of the story. So the story was that intranasal was less effective. Than yeah. A couple of years ago, it was like very, very found to be very, very ineffective. Oh, really? Um, uh, less effective than uh, injected vaccine, right? Correct. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. so um, there could be a number of reasons. Um, one, like I said, um, uh, viruses or vaccines delivered um, mucosally, they have to be delivered um, a certain way. It's also um, possible that there's um, strain to strain variation. So um, the different strains of uh, flu are very different from each other uh, biologically. So um, it, it wouldn't be unusual that uh, the vaccine that's very effective against a particular strain is very ineffective against um, a different strain, right? So um, it, vaccinology is, is very empirical there is um, there is very little that can be uh, safely and accurately predicted. And so that's why we, we have all these clinical trials is because um, we need to document um, empirically what, what the results are. Um, so now in particular for that study that you're mentioning, um, I'm not familiar with it. I, okay. I, I, I'm not sure what the, um, what the reason would be for that. Okay. Um, Sorry, so I, I didn't mean to throw on. something at you. I was just, I just wondered, but thank you. Yep. Um, so uh, for influenza, uh, and this is a vaccine that of course we encourage everyone to take it on a yearly ba basis. Um, the way it works for influenza is um, because it's such a highly variable virus, which most other viruses are not that variable. Influenza is an extreme case. So people um, research what the strains are that are in the field um, that season. And this is a survey that they do for humans and for animals. Um, and then uh, they, uh, they manufacture the vaccine. They usually use three strains of that season and they manufacture the vaccine. And um, this has to be done yearly because um, one of the things about flu that um, many people don't realize the natural um, host for flu, the natural reservoir is uh, populations of wild ducks. And these ducks don't seem to be, get sick with the virus, but um, they have the ability to generate new mutants in, um, every year. And then uh, th these viruses go through several hosts, including pigs, including chickens, and um, they have an ability to um, adapt and modify and mutate as they go through these hosts. And so every year we get different flavors of the flu virus. So the vaccine has to be um, updated basically on a yearly basis. Um, now, uh, one of the reasons I like talking about vaccines is because I think that people need to 
be aware of um, what the reasons are that some people are really against vaccines. And so we need to talk about that for five minutes. I don't know if I have, do I have five more minutes? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Um, so this is a book I recommend for everybody. Uh, the Panic Virus, it goes, it's, it's very historical. It has lots and lots of references. So you can actually go from, from the data that they provide to the original references and read them. Um, this individual, Andrew Wakefield, he, he was a doctor in England and he, um, uh, he had a conflict of interest because the company that he worked for um, wanted to develop a, um, this is a, the measles vaccine. So it actually has three viruses, um, mumps, measles, and rubella. They're similar viruses. They sort of belong together in this vaccine because they're um, paramyxoviruses. They're very similar to each other. Um, well, there, there was a vaccine available, but they wanted their own vaccine to be commercialized. And so they claimed that the normal vaccine induced um, uh, autism, and it was due to this component called thimerosal, which is a preservative that contains mercury. And uh, a couple of years later, it was realized that the data in that paper was fabricated. So the, the paper has been retracted. The data was false. Mr. Wakefield is not allowed to practice medicine anymore. Um, however, the 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 result of that study um, has lasted um, for decades and people still think that vaccines induce autism. So um, there were many clinical trials. I don't have to go time to go over all of that, but it was very clearly demonstrated that the vaccine did not cause autism and that thimerosal in particular, you know, the preservative, did not have anything to do with the induction of um, autism. Now, because autism is a rare disease, um, the numbers of individuals that you have to examine in a clinical trial to really safely conclude that autism is or is not associated with a vaccine, you have to do this with millions of people. And in fact, it has been done because this vaccine has been given all over the world and the data is, um, uh, very, very strong that there is no increase in autism by this vaccine or by other vaccines. Now, this book will explain that in a very um, scientific and historical way. I myself have produced a couple of um, a podcasts where I try to combat misinformation about vaccines. Um, this is something I'm somewhat militant about. And, um, uh, and, and so I wanted to show you what happened with uh, smallpox because, you know, I think smallpox has been the poster child for vaccinology for a number of reasons. So this is the last person in the world to have had smallpox. And that was in 1997. Since then, smallpox does not exist. So now we don't even have to get vaccinated against smallpox. Now, why? The virus is not there anymore. Well, um, why can we eradicate some viruses and not others? Smallpox has no animal reservoir, okay? So could we do this for flu? No. Could we do this for coronaviruses? Probably not because their animal reservoir um, exists and it's, uh, it's bats. For smallpox, there's no animal reservoir. So once it's out of every human, then it's, uh, the virus basically doesn't exist. Okay, another factor was that the, uh, the patients did not produce virus after they recovered. There were no subclinical infections. So that is, if, if you had smallpox, you knew it. So it was really easy to track. The clinical features are very distinct and the vaccine is very effective. Because of all of those factors, we were able to eradicate this virus from the human population. Could we eradicate other viruses? Yes. So polio, I don't know if you guys are aware, polio is coming back and it's coming back in Africa. And the reason is that um, there are unfounded rumors 
that the polio vaccine is tainted with HIV, which, you know, it's absolutely false, but a lot of people are reluctant to take the vaccine. Now, if everybody got vaccinated against polio, polio would actually be eradicated like smallpox because like smallpox, it doesn't have an animal reservoir. The, the, um, the vaccine is effective and there's no latent infection. So because of these factors, we could eliminate polio. We could eliminate measles and we're not successful at eliminating measles and measles is, is making a comeback for the same reason, okay? Um, okay, this is the areas of the world where polio is, uh, can still be found uh, spreading. Very unfortunate because it's a disease that we can very easily um, address through a vaccine. Uh, and my last few words are gonna be about um, cancer vaccines, because I've talked about bacterial and, and viral vaccines. Do we have cancer vaccines? Well, we have the only cancer vaccines that we have available today are vaccines against viruses that cause cancer. And the prime example of that is the human papilloma virus, HPV, okay, which causes cervical carcinomas and it can cause oral cavity cancers. There's also hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and EBV. I'm going to focus a little bit on, on HPV. So um, while we don't have a vaccine for cancers, um, we have a vaccine for viruses that induce cancers. Now, if um, this is from a video I found online, and here's the link. And um, when non-scientists look at videos like this, and I, I encourage you to go and look at it, um, this is a very professionally put together video that has a lot of information that to a non-scientist, it may seem um, uh, plausible. And so, uh, but you can notice here, okay, so this is about the HPV or uh, uh, vaccine. They report hundreds of thousands of adverse reactions um, and even hundreds of deaths due to the HPV vaccine. This is absolutely false. And as you can see here, there's no attribution. So if you wanted to go look at a paper um, where this, these numbers were obtained, you will not find it. This information is false, okay? Um, and so when I went to the WHO um, website, I looked very, very hard for that, for that information. Of course, it doesn't exist. And all I found is, um, and you can see it here, is how, um, the risk of certain um, side effects of the vaccine are so extremely rare. For example, people claim anaphylaxis. Well, 1.7 cases per million doses. You know, just imagine. There was another. Um, the video that I mentioned before talks about Guillain-Barré syndrome. This is a devastating syndrome that causes um, general paralysis, and it has been associated with viral infections. And it's been claimed that uh, the, vac the HPV vaccine causes Guillain-Barré syndrome is completely false. Now, because Guillain-Barré is so rare, it happens with a frequency that is less than 100,000, one in 100,000. Um, the studies to rule out or rule in the, uh, the Guillain-Barré syndrome theory uh, had to use uh, millions and millions of studies. So basically the, the studies that ruled out Guillain-Barre syndrome, they're, um, they're done via metadata. That is, they, they go and they study cases that are reported in multiple papers, and then they can look, th you know, look through all of these cases. And in this particular case, we have 10 million um, doses of the vaccine and clearly the incidence of Guillain-Barre was not affected by, by the vaccine. But of course, you know, some people um, don't want to believe some of that information. So I'm going to summarize uh, what I said here. Um, we already talked about the fact that vaccines are, are very intelligent tool. They're cheap and they're safe. They only need to be administered uh, a finite number of times. Um, 
many pathogens can be fully eradicated from the first of the earth. And we've only achieved that with smallpox, but we could achieve that with many other pathogens. Um, not only vaccines are good, they keep getting better because we develop new technologies. So we now have a very available, um, very capable recombinant DNA and recombinant RNA technology today to make, vac make vaccines. Um, we can use <clears throat> genetic engineering of uh, pathogens and their vectors um, to make the vaccines both safe and effective. And um, I didn't talk about this, but uh, we have been evolving uh, our understanding of how the immune responses are generated. So we actually have tools beyond the pathogens themselves um, through manipulation of the immune system and how the vaccines are administered um, that we can make um, vaccines even more effective and more safe um, based on um, what we know about the immune response. So um, uh, did I say enough about how good vaccines are? Um, anyway, I'll uh, be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, a really quick question. So, so you said that most only take a finite number, small number of, of times that you have to be um, vaccinated. But the, the one that you pointed out that's not the case is flu. And I guess we're thinking that maybe the COVID-19 is going to be similar to flu and need boosters. Is, is that a mixture of a lack of memory of, of us as the or is it simply because of that mutation rate and the fact that the virus is, is changing or is it, is it both? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the answer is all of what you said is true, but it's not the same for uh, flu as it is for, um, for COVID. So okay. for flu, we have an extremely variable virus that um, when we have new strains arising, they're not just different in point mutations that may arise here and there throughout the genome, but um, what happens is a very different flu viruses from very different organisms can uh, coexist and generate recombinants or reassortants. And so you get you know, some of the chromosomes from uh, strain A and some of the chromosomes from strain B, and you can get you can get a combination that is entirely new for us and we don't have immunity to that combination of genes. So this is going to happen on a yearly basis. And yes, we're gonna to have to keep up with uh, administering vaccines constantly, um, developing vaccines constantly. For COVID is a little bit different. And I'm, I'm gonna speculate a little bit here because um, obviously we don't have clear answers for this, but. COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 is actually not that variable. Um, in fact, you know, people talk about this Delta variant and the Delta plus variants. Well, both of those are sensitive to the neutralizing antibodies that were generated against the original um, SARS-CoV-2 strain, okay? So, so these viruses are not different enough that um, the immune response is a complete failure against the new strains, which would be the case for, for flu. Um, okay, so that's, that's one aspect of things. Now, how does uh, SARS-CoV-2 avoid um, immunity? Um, well, I have a suspicion that the antibodies that we induce via intramuscular um, injection are not necessarily of the IgA class. Um, which is the, the antibody that resides in your mucosas. IgA has the ability to go from the blood into the mucosa and uh, then wait for your pathogen to arrive. So um, I think that when we uh, perfect the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines uh, to elicit specifically IgA, I think there's a good chance that we'll have a vaccine that will be even more effective and longer lasting, okay? Um, again, that's how I feel about, uh, about it um, is not necessarily the way it's gonna be, but that would be my prediction. Great, I hope, I hope that's the case because then it sounds like we, uh, 
we have we have intelligent people working on it who know, would know what to do. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> yes, that is the case. Um, that is the case. But in, in any case, the development of the RNA vaccines and the vector vaccines produced by um, J and J uh, that has been done in in record time. I mean, it's just an amazing feat of of the technologies that we um, have um, available to us these days. Well, thank you very much. I just want to be respectful of other, everybody's time and their two o'clock meetings, but oh my gosh, that was the most fun talk. I am super jazzed. I do a lot of research in how to communicate about vaccines to try to get people to get vaccinated. So I'm a risk communication person, but I never understood vaccines to the level I did today, all the background in it. So this has really helped me. I'm going to make my postdoc watch it um, next week so that he better understands all the kind of the biology of it. So thank you so much for this. Education. May I ask you one question, Angie? Yeah. So I want you to explain to me why some people will not take the, the COVID, vac COVID vaccine, but they'll go and take ivermectin. <laughs> you know what? If you and I could figure that out, we could make <laughs> billions. I don't, I, I'm, I'm losing my mother love and mind on that. Like, like, you think this is more experimental, but this, is, yeah, I, I don't understand it. And we ask people like, you know, what is your biggest concern? And, and they say it's how fast the drug was developed and concerns about side effects. So we address both of those issues in a subsequent survey so with the same people. And we gave them showing how many decades we've been working on mRNA vaccines that this didn't just like start, you know, once COVID started, there had been decades of work that you know culminated at this point. And then we talked about what are the side effects of getting COVID and what are the side effects of the vaccine side by side. Didn't do a darn thing. And darn is not the word I usually use when I talk about right. this, but so, I'm in play company. Yeah, that's why we need psychologists because my science cannot explain that. I know. So, so it, it is not science. And so, you know, we're trying to figure out who are the groups that are movable. And one of the groups that we're looking to see is the folks who, um, who've had COVID, who don't think that they need another vaccine. So though, I mean, you're not going to move the people who are taking in or however you say it, you're not going to move them, right? Like I can yell at them and beg with them and give them all the data. They're not going to ever change, but there's this group of people who don't know what to do. Right. That, and so we're trying to see actually, are these people movable? Because let's let's focus on the people who it might just be a lack of knowledge, not because, you know, they worship at the feet of certain people who shall not be named like Voldemort. Um, and and they don't you know, they don't they will never get vaccinated. Right. Because and it's you know, that's their right. But like we're not going to change them. So I'm not going to waste my energy on them. So there's a I think there's a lot of people in America who are in the middle, right? Like there's a really pro-vaccine people and they're really anti-vaccine people and you're not gonna change either of them, right? That's right. But there's this, there's a bigger, pretty big chunk in the middle who have, you can imagine some good reasons, right? And, and I've done a lot of work with vaccine resistant people and some of them are really fascinating, right? They're, the, you know, the things that they're thinking about are very interesting. You can kind of see where they're coming from. It's not just, you know, uneducated. A lot of these people are really highly educated and have really good reasons. And so instead of just telling people that they're stupid, right, or you're just listening to Trump or you're stupid or you're being influenced by it, we need to understand what, what is scaring you and let us try and tailor the message to what's scaring you or where your concerns are. Can I ask a question, Angie? When, yeah. When they're talking about that, I'm sorry, others can leave if they want. I know we've kind of gone over time, but this is, because I, I, the other thing that kind of um, it puzzles me why people don't understand the, huge, the herd immunity argument and the fact that you're doing it for a society, not just yourself. And I'm just wondering when you're actually doing the, when you're talking to people, are they only interested in themselves or do they get this idea that- They don't care. They don't- see, We see did that. hypothetically. So before COVID, I had a, a big grant from the EU and it was right after H1N1. And we did this in about 12 countries in the, in the, in the EU. And, and, and I guess UK was in the EU at that time. Um, and what we found was we asked like, you know, would you be willing to 
you know, like we, we gave them scenarios that why it would be important. Like your, your neighbors are all, and we gave like four or five different scenarios. And the only one I think that it moved people were if your sibling's child had cancer, like an extreme, right? How many right. times does your sibling's child have cancer? Not often, right? But not for the old person, not for the person in your neighborhood that you might come to at the grocery store who has cancer. Like, you know, it, and that even only moved a little bit, right? So it, it really is, I mean, and there are cases I think with COVID that we've seen with people that when, um, you know, like they want to see the grandparents, they want to see their parents. Then I think it's, that's helped move here versus flu or H1N1 where it didn't seem as, as dangerous. But I think it's really about people's, and some of these are really, you know, I think some of these are valid concerns. I think if I was pregnant, I would have to really understand it because I think it seems scary, right? Like, and then, you know, even though I'd also probably get the vaccine because I'd want to protect my fetus. And there's been a lot of pregnant women in the ICUs. I mentor an ICU doc. He is, he is taking care of, sometimes it's half his, his, this is in Michigan, half his patients are pregnant women and they're really sick. Wow, right. That's so sad. Um, but so it, but it's, but you can imagine, I can imagine scenarios where that would be really scary, right? If you're pregnant. So there's a lot of times like people have their, there's some basis to their concerns. And I think what we do too often, and I was, and I apologize, I was being flippant about people who are, you know, just influenced by politicians or entertainers or football players, you know, but I think the, I think there's a, there's, there's a population of those, but there's also just a great amount of people who just, are scared and they're and they don't understand and they're being told that it's bad you know and 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 don't have the the knowledge or do, don't have the access to go and find out you know and so we need to I think a lot of times we just get really angry with them like oh you're just stupid you're making a bad decision or you're putting other people at risk what kind of bad person are you and i think we really need to understand like how to reach them where they're at instead of just saying, well, it's the right thing. The scientist told you it's the right thing because that doesn't work. I mean, you know, I know I shouldn't drink sugar or eat, not drink sugar, eat sugar as much, but I still do. Right. <laughs> There's lots of drinkable sugar around. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. It's really complicated. And we, we have failed and failed and failed and failed and failed in COVID. We failed freaking a lot and it's yep. really discouraging. Very disappointing. It is very disappointing. I keep fighting. Yes, yeah, so we'll have keep these, fighting the good fight. These podcasts, please go to my podcast. Um, well, you know, it's I'm not going to preach to the choir. I don't need to convince you guys, but um, um, I'm also very curious about who and why some people um, produce these very professional-looking videos talking against the vaccines and producing this fabricated data that is completely false and made up. And who's behind that? So for example, um, I can tell you during the uh, George W. Bush presidency, um, he delayed the implementation of the HPV vaccine as long as he, as, as long as he could. Um, and eventually the HPV vaccine was implemented and it's extremely efficacious, right? But uh, there's all this propaganda, you know, who does this? Anyway, I, we're way over time. We're way over time. Uh, oh, we could talk all day. But uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I will do this anytime. <laughs>